Johnny Dollar. George Reed here. Well, good for you, George. What? I can use an assignment about now. Who's in trouble this time? John Patrick O'Shea. Never heard of him. He's retired and lives here in Hartford. He's been confined to a wheelchair for the past couple of years. Now, what's happened to him? At 11 o'clock last night, someone broke into his home and gave him a terrible beating. Oh. Probably would have killed him if his next-door neighbor hadn't barged in and scared the assailant away. Want to give me his address? I'll run over and see him. Better still, why don't you pick me up here at the office and we'll both go over there. Sure, whatever you say. You see, Johnny, I myself am somewhat involved in this thing. You? Yes. Why don't you come on over here? Yeah. Okay, George. I'll see you in a couple of minutes. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Floyd's of England, North American office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the wrong man matter. George Reed, somehow involved in the beating up of a helpless old man? Hard to believe. Finally, I grabbed a taxi that signed him one dollar twenty and met him at his office. Then, using his car, we drove east on Maple Drive. Yes, Harry Marshall. He's the young male nurse who's been taking care of Mr. O'Shea these past couple of years, Johnny, ever since the old man lost the use of his legs and started living in a wheelchair. I see. Last night, Mr. O'Shea sent Marshall over to see me regarding a change in his life insurance policy. What, uh, what kind of a change, George? Well, O'Shea's nearest relative is a ne'er-do-well nephew, a boy of 25 or so who lives up in Boston. Uh, a beneficiary of the old man's policy? No. You see, Mr. O'Shea doesn't have much money, only a small pension and the residue of whatever he was able to collect on the accident to his legs. So? Just what he's been paying Marshall for taking care of him, I don't know. But I doubt if it's very much. Nevertheless, Marshall has devoted himself entirely and unselfishly to the old man. So to make up for the lack of fancy wages, Mr. O'Shea bought some insurance and named Harry Marshall as the beneficiary. Exactly. But Marshall felt that O'Shea ought to make some provision for his nephew, whether he liked him or not. After all, his only living relative. Well, this Marshall sounds like a pretty unusual fellow. He is. He's a very fine chap, Johnny. Anyhow, he came over to my house last night to tell me he'd finally persuaded Mr. O'Shea to change his policy. To cut in this worthless nephew? Yes. What time did he get there and tell you this? He didn't. That is, the poor fellow must have waited for a couple of hours. What do you mean? Well, my wife and I were out. We'd gone to the movies. She insisted on seeing the second feature. A horrible picture, by the way. So we didn't get home until nearly 11.30. Uh Now, here. I found this note in the door. Mr. Reed, sorry to have missed you, but it's after 11 now, so I think I'd better get back to Mr. O'Shea. Please call me in the morning. I believe I have convinced him that he should name Walter and his insurance. Uh, That refers to Walter Berry, the nephew. Hope you and Mrs. Reed enjoyed the movie. Respectfully, Harry Marshall. So? So by the time Marshall got back home, the old man had been attacked and his neighbor had called in the police. First thing this morning, Marshall phoned me. Uh, now, here we are, Johnny. Ah. Oh, Mr. Reed, I'm glad you were able to come. I told you on the phone this morning this is a terrible thing. Terrible. Yes, Harry, I'm sure it is. Uh, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar, a special investigator for us. Oh, good. Excellent. Uh, Won't you come in, please? Uh, Lieutenant Barley's already here. Yeah, sure, thanks. Has he found anything that might indicate... Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Hello, Dollar. Here, uh, take a look at this. Yeah? The attacker must have come and gone by way of the living room window. Apparently tore this off his coat or pants on his way out. Oh, Harris Tweed. Yeah. Anything else? Not a thing. Where's Mr. O'Shea? Upstairs in bed. Doc says he's in pretty bad shape, but that he'll pull through. The doctor left a few minutes ago, Mr. Doc. And O'Shea himself hasn't been able to give you anything, huh, Lieutenant? Nothing. Except that the man sneaked up on him from behind and slugged him. He didn't hear him, didn't see him. Oh, great. Somehow, Mr. Dollar, you've got to find the man who did this. And when you do, I, I only wish you'd turn him over to me. Easy, boy. Just leave him up to us. Don't bank on that, Lieutenant. No, I've got to go back to headquarters. Huh? What do you mean by that, Marshal? I simply mean that I could kill the man who did this. Don't try it. Find anything, Dollar. Give me a call. Yeah, sure, Lieutenant. Oh, would you like to see Mr. O'Shea now? No. 
No, Marshal. There are a couple of other things I'd like to do first. Oh? What, Johnny? Let's just sit down here in the living room and talk for a few minutes. You have some idea? Yes, Mr. Dunn. No, no, I didn't say that. But come on. Let's sit down and talk. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. In the history of America, the inventor has had a place of importance equal to that of statesmen and other national leaders. Indeed, our inventors, many of them mechanics, craftsmen, or even thoughtful tinkerers, have strongly influenced our destiny. They have contributed greatly to our amazing development from a barren outpost of civilization to the foremost industrial nation in the world. Incidentally, when we think of great inventions, it's natural to think of involved mechanisms like the McCormick Reaper, the sewing machine, or the phonograph. However, some inventions are so simple one wonders why they weren't thought of centuries before. An invention in this category is, of all things, the universal, all-important safety pin. This was the invention of Walter Hunt, who lived in New York in the first hatchery. Between 1832 and 1859, he created and patented more original and worthwhile inventions than any man in the country. A revolver, a repeating rifle and a bullet with a metal cartridge containing its own explosive charge. But of all his simple inventions, the safety pin is the most useful. It was patented in 1849, and he gave the patent to a draftsman in discharge of a very small debt. Somehow there must be a way. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Wrong Man Matter. <laughs> What time did you leave this house last night, Marshal? A few minutes of ten. I went over to see Mr. Reed here to tell him about a... Well, about a change that Mr. O'Shea had finally agreed to make in his insurance. It was something Mr. Reed and I had discussed before. Yes, but as I told you, Johnny, my wife and I were at the movies. Yeah, George. Had Mr. O'Shea gone to bed by then, Marshal? No, sir. He was sitting here in the living room. In his wheelchair, of course. Watching television. He always stayed up late watching television. And... Uh, well, to be honest about it, he usually slept through most of it. Mm, that I can understand. So I quietly left and I went over to Mr. Reed's home. When I found they were out, well, when 11 o'clock came around and they still hadn't returned, I decided I'd better come back here. Go on. When I got here, I found the front door wide open. Inside were Mr. Wakeley from next door and a couple of policemen. And there's... Poor old Mr. O'Shea. That neighbor, uh, Mr. Wakeley, did you say? That's right, Stuart M. Wakeley. In other words, me. I didn't hear you ring, Mr. Wakeley. Time like this, you expect me to be far more young man? And who are you, sir? Another policeman? Plain clothesman? Mr. Dollar is an investigator for my insurance company, Mr. Wakeley. I'm George Reed. Why didn't you send for me, Marshal? What was that? This man Dollar would probably want to know just what I found here last night while you were out gallivanting around someplace instead of being here where you should have been take care of that old, uh, old O'Shea. I beg your pardon. Well, weren't you? I hardly see it's any business of yours. But I just happened to have been out on an errand for Mr. O'Shea. Well, all right. Which reminds me, Mr. Reed, you will make the changes in the policy, won't you? Oh, well, of course. Well, all I got to say... Yeah. Go ahead and say it, Mr. Wakeley. Is that if it wasn't for me coming over here the way I did, old man O'Shea would be dead as a doornail right now. Not that I'd cared particular. Just how was it you happened to come over here last night, Mr. Wakeley? Are you in the habit of dropping in here at all hours? On that old crackpot O'Shea? Well, I am not. <laughs> Good heavens, no. It's the first time Mr. Wakeley ever so much as entered this house. After all. Oh, just what time did you get here, by the way? Well, it's not more than two, three minutes after 11 o'clock. You're sure of that? Well, of course I'm sure. I've been trying... You hear me? I've been trying to hear the 11 o'clock news on the radio. Time. That's the reason I come. Marshal, that's the same time ready to leave George Reed's home and come back here. Yes. Like I started to say, the reason I come over here was to tell that crazy old man to turn down his television. What? Inconsiderate old fool. Night after night, that dang thing uh, squawking away so loud you can hear it all over the block. 
driving me and everybody else out of their minds. Mr. O'Shea is slightly hard of hearing, Mr. Wakely. Slightly. <laughs> now, Mr. Didn't Wakely. I call you on the telephone, Marshal, almost every single night and beg you to turn that thing down and I'd come over and do something about it? Yes, you certainly did. Uh, but a lot of good it done me. So that's why I come over here last night, Mr. Dollar, to tell the old man and this smart young whippersnapper that if they didn't turn down that TV and leave us there some peace around yes, here... Yes, yes, I'm sure. Now, would but you when I got up on the porch, I heard the old cooter hollering for help. Even over that squawk box, I could hear him. And I heard his wheelchair fall over, and him still uh, yelling for help. So what did you do? So I banged on the door, and I finally busted it open. And, well, you know what I found in here. Just what did you find? Oh, man, oh, she... Laying down the floor, all cut, and that window back of them wide open. And you called the police? Yes, sir. And that's when Marshal, that should have been here taking care of him, that's when he come in. And, of course, I sent for the doctor. And, Marshal, you have no idea who might have done it. I wish to heaven I had. I'll tell you this, mister. Yes? Everybody living on the block, everybody in range of that noise machine would have been willing to murder him for it. Yes, sir. Even you, Mr. Wakeman. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I shoot. No, 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 wait. I, I didn't mean that. You sure? Now, now, listen carefully. Motive? Opportunity? Let's give a little thought to that, huh? We'll return to Johnny Dollar in a moment. The two men approach each other. Cautiously. Intently. A fearful murmur sweeps through the crowd. Women and children scurry for cover. The two men stop about 30 paces apart. Silence fills the street. Each man's hand hovers over the pearl handle in his holster. And at an unheard signal, pistols are drawn. Two shots ring out. And one man falls to the dusty street. Dead. The hero holsters his weapon and ambles toward the saloon. Thus ends, or begins, the great source of American entertainment, the Western. Although glamorized now, the six-shooter did play an important part in the settling of the West. The man responsible for that ingenious weapon was Samuel Colt. Born in 1814, Colt, as a child, had an insatiable interest in gunpowder and the weapons that used it. As a young man, he was dissatisfied with the current one-shot pistols then in use. One day he remembered a sea voyage he had taken when he was 13, and how he had been fascinated by the ship's paddle wheel. Why not use a similar wheel in a pistol? Working feverishly, he finally perfected a weapon with a rotating barrel of six chambers. Thus, the six-shooter was born. Like most inventions, however... It took time to gain the public's acceptance. The opportunity came. War with Mexico was declared in 1846, and soldiers returning from the war told of the great success they had had with the Colt 45. Soon, the Texas Rangers adopted the repeating pistol in their many battles with the Indians. Samuel Colt, an inspired American with the philosophy that somehow there must be a way. Let's find it. <laughs> I don't know what you're trying to prove. I mean about me, but I warn you, Dollar. Warn me, Mr. Wakeley. That's right. You accuse me of anything, I'll make you mighty sorry you did. You see what I mean? Johnny. Good heavens. Oh, now, wait a minute. Have you got a license for that thing, Mr. Wakeley? You bet I have, ever since I was a bank messenger. And if you think I wouldn't use it to protect myself... Or to quiet an old man who was disturbing you? Stop talking like that. But then when you realized you'd gone too shut far... Up, shut up! Okay. Okay. Just... Take it easy and... Let me have that. <laughs> Sorry. Good Lord. Mr. Dollar. Mr. Dollar, if he is the All one... All right, take it easy. I'll kill him. Oh, no, you won't, George. Yes, John. Call Lieutenant Barley to come back here and take over. Yes. And, Marshal, you keep an eye on Wakely while I go up and talk with Mr. O'Shea. Don't worry, Mr. Dollar. And that means don't lay a hand on him. Even after what he's done? That's right. But listen, we haven't proved anything But yet. good heavens, Look, man. I'm in charge here now, and you'll take orders from me, understand? 
Well? Yes, sir. All right. I started up the stairway, hoping Mr. O'Shea would be in condition to talk. But then, suddenly, something I'd overlooked from the very beginning. Hey, George. Come here a minute, would you? Yes, yes, Tommy. Come here. Hey, look. Tell me one thing before you make that phone call. Yes? Just when did you and your wife decide to go to that movie last night? What? Well, come on, come on. Well, it was after dinner. We had no other plans. We weren't expecting any... Now, what does that mean? Plenty, George. Plenty. Plenty. <laughs> Quick look in Mr. O'Shea's room told me he was out like a light. No doubt the doctor had given him something to make him sleep. But that was all right by me. I had other ideas now. I located... Meantime, you're to keep an eye on Mr. Wakeley. You are, George. What? I got to leave you two for a few minutes and keep an eye on Marshall, too. On me, Mr. Dollar? I don't want Mr. Wakeley harmed. Just see that he stays here. Marshall, if I come back and find that you've so much as touched him... I gave you my word. Okay. See that you keep... Mr. Marshall keeps the room for himself right upstairs. Good, then if you don't... Clean cut, young man, ain't he? Is he? Don't use the room very much, though. Yeah, well, if you... Get a place for him to relax and be alone by himself now and then. Yeah. No, after having to spend all the rest of his time nursing that old man he works for. Take me up to his room, please, will you? Well, now, I don't know. All right, here, here, my credentials. Hey? Johnny Dollar? Yes. Special investigator? Yes, that's right. Let's go, please. You mean he's in trouble, Mr. Darling? I didn't say that. Oh, well, I'm glad you didn't. Harry Marshall's a mighty nice young man, devoting all his time to that Mr. O'Shea. Yeah. Not every young fellow these days. Now, here we are. Where does he keep his clothes? Hey? Okay. Oh, we're right Oh, yes, here it is. We don't keep very many of it. Hey, now, that's a nice-looking one. Harris Tweed, ain't it? Yeah. But now, look. See? Yeah, I see. Ask me. He should have had that mended. Ask me. It's his ways he should have mended. What? Dollar, where you been? On a little errand, Lieutenant. Just got back here myself. And I see you've nailed down the man we're after. I mean, nailed him down. Wakely's still out cold. Oh, I just started to tell the lieutenant what went on here, Mr. Darling. I must say I wouldn't have suspected him. Well, I guess there's no question, is there, Mr. Mr. Yeah. Huh? Oh, I see you found the coat that was torn when he escaped out the window. Where? Where'd you find it? In a little rooming house over on South Elm. I see. Well, I don't. Marshal, your suggestion that Mr. O'Shea had another beneficiary to his policy was real smart. A worthless nephew. That way, even if your plan failed, not too much of the money would be diverted away from you. His plan, Johnny. But of course, if Mr. O'Shea were to die or be murdered before the change was made in the policy, why, nobody in the world would think to suspect you. You don't think young Marshall was in this, too? It was a one-man job, Lieutenant. Fortunately, it failed. Because of Mr. Wakely. Huh? Yeah, you better call a doctor, George. I'm afraid I must have hit Mr. Wakely pretty hard. Hey, now, look here, Dollar. Tell me, Mr. Dollar. What, uh... Well, I guess the expression is tipped you off. Marshall? You must have been waiting for your opportunity very patiently, Marshall. You must have checked on George Reed very carefully. To make sure he wouldn't be home when you called on him to establish your alibi. Well, somebody please tell me. Now, look, Johnny, how is he to know that my wife and I were out to a movie last night? I didn't tell him where we'd been until he phoned this morning. But the note he left on your front door said... Pretty stupid of me, wasn't it? Yeah. Got a pair of handcuffs, Lieutenant? I sure have. They... They won't be necessary. Congratulations, Mr. Dollar. Mm -hmm. So, George, having saved your company from having to pay off the old man's insurance, well, how much is my fee going to be? If it's big enough, of course, I'll forget all about the... Wait a minute. What expense account? A lousy buck for the trip over to your office this morning? Well, me. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, G. Stanley Jones, Jeff Stratton, Sam Edwards, and Junius Matthews. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> <laughs>